It's actually quite funny. Before I could email David uh, to ask if uh, I still had a slot, he had actually sent me a very nice email saying that, uh, uh, that indeed I did. So I'm very happy to, to be here. Um, so uh, my name is Jay Bregman. Uh, I'm currently an artist living in New York City. Um, <laughs> I think the description of this talk, and as David has said, it says it's going to be about HALO's uh, international plans, but you all read the papers. So uh, I thought instead I'd speak from the heart and tell you a little bit about how I got here um, and how I fell in love with robots, which are my next project, in hopes that maybe you'll find my journey familiar and maybe even a little inspiring. Um, I've also tried to chronicle the lessons that I've learned with, e with each creation. Get rid of this guy here. I hope nobody needs that. Uh, so I believe that the next generation, the best thing the next generation can do to increase their odds of becoming a good entrepreneur, a question I get asked pretty often, is getting a good education. Of course there are exceptions, but they are just that. To me, being an entrepreneur is being the ultimate generalist. And a liberal education gives you a little bit of exposure to everything and teaches you not just how to solve, but how to think, how to frame the problem in the first place. Luckily for entrepreneurs in the ecosystem around them, the world is full of problems and always will be. Maybe in the future, problems will become mere annoyances, but I suspect we will just recalibrate and call them problems again. So, uh, about me. My father was an inventor. His calling was the heart. I have no idea how he got onto that, but every time I go to the gym and see my heart rate or listen to the heartbeats on Dark Side of the Moon, I think about it. When I was young, I tinkered. I built contraptions out of nearly anything. I learned the principles of combustibility and the physics of smoke detectors at a very early age, as the local fire department can attest. To reward my curiosity, my father built me a workbench in an isolated nook in the basement, and it worked. I began to build more complex things. I enrolled in a local model, model rocketry course. I didn't even think I ever retrieved a single rocket. I kept trying to make them bigger and add radio-controlled steering, of all things. It didn't work. But I loved it, and I signed up for every advanced course that I could. To all of you that grew up in northern New Jersey, if 20 years ago a rocket landed mysteriously on your front lawn, that was probably me, and I'm really sorry about that. So after I ran out of rockets, I started building mechanized vehicles. First, electric RC cars. I graduated to gas power. When that got boring, I built a ramp in my backyard to jump them over each other in kind of an evil Knievel style fashion. I switched to planes. I never really got into helicopters because I found computers. My first computer was a Commodore 64. It was awesome, which is to say that it could do so little, but so much more than anything before it. I remember sneaking out of my room downstairs uh, to its setup downstairs when I was supposed to be sleeping. I decided to tell you all of this because I think the best ideas, the ones that really are truly ours, are those where we take childhood dreams and continue them and bring them to life. When I arrived in London, I was a student. I took an entrepreneurship course at LSC that told me a bit of what to do, and I was off and running. I met a friend who had, sent, had to send dozens of same-day couriers every day as part of his job. It was a total drag. So we took a look at the industry and worked out a plan to turn it upside down. E-courier was born. Some of you might have used it. It was probably about five years too early, but it was fun and a real challenge, doing everything from operations to enterprise sales to engineering. My biggest lesson from that business was that the better you hire, the better off you will be. It's been said many times, but worth saying again, there is no such thing as overqualified, only mispositioned. I like hiring because I think it's the ultimate test of how well you can sell your vision and ultimately sell yourself. When the business was sold to a competitor in 2010, I just kept going. To be honest, I wasn't too happy about the way that it ended up, and I felt that I had a lot to prove. I was also broke, and although I looked briefly at getting a job with a uh, later stage startup, I just couldn't resist having another go. So the story of Halo, and the beauty of Halo, in my view, is in the drivers and all of their stories. Just yesterday, I took a late night ride from Paddington to the Tower of London. If you do this journey, the GPS route will take you straight across the city on a Thursday night. Luckily, the black cabbie explained he was going to do a double bridge run. This is one of my favorite moves. 
You go south across the river, you cut across Suffolk, and you shoot back up Suffolk's Bridge. Sure, sure enough, there was no traffic, and we saved about 20 minutes, despite a materially longer route. The cabbie took a little time to warm up, but I know what I'm doing, and he turned out to be delightfully entertaining. He was a true cockney, he said, because he was born in earshot of the Bow Bells. We talked about the development of East London. 27 years ago, he helped build the first building on Canary Wharf, Lloyd's TSB. It was a perfect experience. But what was the experience? It wasn't just the ride. It was the driver and the stories and the humanity. And of course, it was the route. For many years, I have been trying to take offline processes online, converting things from analog to digital. Many of us do. But what I learned at Halo more than anything else is that sometimes there is some part of the experience, however small and seemingly insignificant, that cannot cross over. This is why musicians and audiophiles collect records. This is why there are still bookstores. This is why I believe the driverless cars face a tough road. This is not nostalgia. It is a totally reasonable realization that even efficiency entrepreneurs are selling social and ultimately human services. You might find it odd for a robotics entrepreneur to talk so much about humanity, but that's exactly it. When I told my mother I was starting a robotics business, she was concerned, to say the least. Um, we've all seen the movies. Privacy and safety are and should be paramount concerns as robots outpace human capabilities. I want to tell you a bit about how I fell in love with them and where I think all of this is going. Looking back, I think I can trace it all down to Wired, uh, at least to Chris Anderson, one of its former editors. You see, I wanted to get back into the RC world that I love so much, but Toby Koppel, now a partner at Mosaic Ventures, said that I should go to Berkeley and see Chris, who had just started a new company called 3D Robotics. I got into Berkeley just in time to video him putting the sign on the door. The office is in an old industrial garage, for lack of a better word, with robots everywhere. Most of them are unmanned aerial vehicles, which are commonly called drones, but for which we need to figure out a much better term. And as I looked on in awe, Chris showed me his team's creations, and he showed me and told me that his secret sauce was a programmable open source brain, or autopilot, that allowed the complete automation of the drone's capabilities. I've done it. They take off by themselves, image an area, and land themselves. It is breathtaking when you see something like that, so powerful, come so alive. I was so excited by what Chris showed me that I wanted to go and see the production and design facility in San Diego. I figured it would be pretty easy to drive from San Diego, from LA. And besides, what a better time to borrow a fast car and drive down the Pacific Coast Highway. Another childhood dream. But I only seem to drive in California. I don't even have a British driver's license, to be honest. So I was absolutely terrified when my ride showed up. A brand new convertible Lamborghini Diablo. What a machine. The only problem is that I had to bring my drone with me um, to get looked at, and it didn't fit in the tiny trunk. So there I went on the road to San Diego in a Lamborghini with a drone riding shotgun. Despite its power, it was no match for traffic, and I was hours late. I met the 3DR team who talked about their previous experience building, no joke, underwater lumber robots. We fixed my iris and heading for the, headed for the parking lot where I had my first flight. And as I watched it take off and saw the heartbeats from the GPS indicator, I knew I was home. This was the future, and for once, I was right on time. Machines can be fickle, though. I learned this when I was trying to leave ecstatic, and the battery in the door opener failed. Luckily, I was in the right place, and for the price of a few rounds around the parking lot, the 3DR team got me back on the road. I believe we are witnessing the dawn of something magical. The internet brought us computers, or brought our computers and ourselves together. Mobile gave us legs. Robotics will give us wings. They will extend the range of human capabilities far further and far faster than any of these previous revolutions. I believe that in 10 years, this room will be filled with robots of all kinds, and the sight of flying robots will be as common as traffic on the embankment. The range of industries which will be evolved through technology 
this time will widen and deepen. And with all the problems in the world today, man, we need all the help we can get. Robots will help educate and challenge and motivate us. In evolving their capabilities, they will also shine a light on us as people and reveal what is irreplaceably human. As much as anything else, they will help see ourselves with unparalleled clarity and confidence. But as much as I am excited, I am also concerned. I believe we need to make concerted efforts now to make sure robots do not become the next supermarket self-checkout machines or unprogrammable VCRs. We need to make them easy to use and talk to each other. We need to make sure that they socialize smartly, that they respect privacy and that they keep us safe. I believe this is too important to be left to laws. We need an architectural solution. My name is Jay Bregman, and I am an artist and a dreamer and a frontiersman that's soon to come robotics revolution. I'm very excited to meet all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That's excellent. So, Thank you very much. Talking about your new business, which yeah. aspect of robotics excites you as having well, economic so, opportunity? So I, I think that the, the biggest uh, aspect of it is both the networking, but more so really compliance. I, I mean, th this idea that basically there might need to be a regulatory or compliance layer for robots that basically ensured their keeping with a certain set of principles. I don't want to go back to the kind of three laws, but I think that, that there's a much more advanced version of that that really does need to be a common protocol that is, uh, you know, is hardwired in. Um, it needs a lot of exploration, but it, you know, that seems to be a common trend that uh, you know, now that drones have accidentally flown into the US Open uh, and basically other places, you know, it was a football match I think the other night, people are really starting to, to want to regulate them at the local level. Um, because they really, you know, there are just too many of them and do, they're doing their own thing. It's, it is like the Wild West. So I think that has to be stopped but in a way that continues the growth of the industry. And talking about Halo, what were the big challenges? Well, I mean, I think the biggest challenge in a global business that's, that's scaled as fast as that is everything comes at the expense of something else. And so when you're going into one city and then you get an opportunity in another city somewhere else, um, you know, you really have to think about where you want to deploy your resources because however much capital you have, headspace is finite. There were other companies aggressively pushing into those territories and there were, you know, reports that individual companies were using dirty tricks to yeah. call up book cabs from other companies. How, how much of a problem was the competitive threat? So I, ca I can't really speak to that, but, um, you know, look, I think time will tell on all those things. Okay. And if Halo's pulled out of North America, um, does it have a future as an international business? Oh, it already is an international business. I mean, look, you know, I was just in Ireland for the One Young World uh, event, which is an event for, uh, you know, kids from 180 countries around the world that people go to. Um, you know, and we are coast to coast, you know, in, in that country. It's, you know, it, it, Spain you just mentioned as well. We're in Singapore, uh, you know, as well as other places in Asia. So it, it, to me, it's a question of where the real growth area is. And it, you know, it's clear to me it's in Europe and Asia. So last question. Um, if you could have done something different inside Halo with hindsight, what would you have done? Well, it's a really tough question. I think um, really... Uh, nothing specific. I mean, I, I haven't been operationally involved in the business, as you can see. I've been working on this new thing for, for many months. Um, but, you know, I, I think basically it's always a tough thing to understand, you know, when your business model is going to be more appropriate to a particular jurisdiction and not. Um, you know, I'm not sure that we really could have done anything differently. So I think that, and certainly not personally, but it's a good question. Thank you. Jay Bregman. All right. Thank you. Uh,